Mitch, been made. Yeah, Mitch Marsh. That's what I mean. I don't have to make it yet. Need a microphone. Put it on the auction and sell it for a million. You need microphones. Oh. Even if they don't work, at least you can. Shut up! <laughs> I think that's everybody here that's coming in here, unless we have some this late. Like, like. Alright. Alright. So, does anybody know what Proverbs 22 3 says? <laughs> Did anybody look it up before? You know what it says, don't you? Anybody? You are prepared to shut my fear, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we're going to talk about, is how we can survive a tornado. Okay? Now, somebody on Facebook this morning says, nobody's ever prepared to lose their house. Right? And they're not. You're not prepared to lose your house. You're not prepared to lose your life. But you need to be prepared for whatever comes along. And one of those is tornadoes because we have those here all the time this is a place where tornadoes are so I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, I'm a weather bug and I'm a space nut so any of those two things I can talk about all day long um, I didn't go to college for weather that was my plan um, I took several classes in high school on weather and astronomy and then I joined into uh, disaster relief so we go all over and fix houses that have been destroyed and places of worship that have been destroyed and stuff like that and i'm also i also own a masonry company so we also build shelters so i i can tell you what kind of shelters work what kind of shelters don't work if you ever have questions about that so anyway we'll just get started um with a few little facts. So tornado season we know is from March till June. So we're not quite in the middle of tornado season yet. So there's about 70 fatalities per season. There's more than that per year, but per season, March through June, there's about 70 every year. So does anybody know how many fatalities we've had so far this year? Where, here or just everywhere? In the United States. We're already at 63. Wow. So we're not even halfway through the season, and we've already had 63 fatalities when the average is 70. So then the average amount of tornadoes that are reported per season is about 660, give or take. So does anybody know how many tornadoes we've had so far? 449. Wow. So we're on a roll to beat our average in this season so far. So does anybody know what direction 90% of tornadoes come from? Southeast. How far? Southwest. Southwest, Southwest, Southwest to northeast. To northeast. northeast. But don't rely on that. Uh, when I was in high school, way back a long time ago, <laughs> we were out in the parking lot and we actually had to argue with the weather service because the tornado that came through came the opposite direction. It came from the northeast and went southwest. Everybody saw it. We didn't have cell phones back then, so nobody got a picture of it. And all they saw was the aftermath? All they saw was the aftermath, which was twisted up stuff. It should have told them something. But they were first, they were like, well, we think it's high circular winds. And then they changed it later once they had enough people to prove that that tornado went the opposite direction they usually go to. But even though 90% go that one direction, from that way to this way, and that's where you should be looking when somebody says there's a tornado coming, they don't always. So, does anybody know what time tornadoes like to come through? Most of the time. Well, you're Early morning. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Early morning. It's, it's evening. It's between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. Lately, here, it's been after, after nine. It's 
mm -hmm. like 10 ish, sometimes early in the morning. But again, times, Dark time. <laughs> tornadoes don't have a watch. <laughs> so they can happen any time of day or night and anywhere and come from any direction. So we already know that it's hurricanes, we have a week most of the time to know which direction they are headed and they turn slowly. Not a tornado, we all know that. They can pop out of the clear blue sky, <laughs> pretty much. You've seen pictures of tornadoes and it's the person taking the picture, the light shining behind them because mm -hmm. there's sun shining behind them. So it can happen in an instant, in a, just really quick. So uh, of course they can change direction so if you're outside watching one and you see it's going the opposite direction of you, don't count that it's going to stay that way. They can turn and they can actually backtrack on the same path they were taking. So it's important that we watch when they say there's a tornado. So the common signs, dark skies with a greenish glow, not always, but most of the ones I've seen have the greenish glow to it. Hail. The bigger the hail is, the more likely there's a tornado because the winds that are circulating are throwing that hail back up in the air, back up and back down. And as it goes up into the atmosphere, it gathers more water. And then it comes down and gets pushed back up. So large hail is more likely, any hail, but large hail is more likely to have a tornado attached to it. Um, a lot of people know this, that the winds often calm. They don't always do them but a few minutes before it may be blowing, and all of a sudden it's calm. Um, winds that change direction. Obviously, because tornadoes go going like that. <laughs> um, the birds often become quiet. Sometimes they'll even land on the ground if they're in the air. And of course, the classic train roar. Um, I have a friend that I worked with a few years back, and she had never heard or seen a tornado before and a tornado went right by her house and she said, I, I didn't even know, I didn't hear the horn blow. Because <laughs> somebody told her it sounded like a train. So she thought she was gonna hear a horn blow. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, people claim that they can feel and even smell a tornado. Sulfur. Yes, <laughs> I, it is true. You can feel it, of course, when it gets sticky, nasty, heavy and then you can smell the sulfur. Not all the time, but a lot of times you can smell it in the air. Um, sometimes people claim it's a metallic smell. So it's, it's a, a different smell, so. But anyway, those are some of the things about tornadoes, little facts. They're not always true, but they're often true, so. So one of the questions was, are tornadoes always accompanied by rain, hail, or lightning? Like I said, it may not even be raining when you see a tornado fall out of the sky. So we always gotta be alert when we know there's a storm here. Do tornadoes skip? This one's a hard one because we've seen it, right? Where it hits a house, skips a house, hits another house and skips, right? According to the weather surface though, that's not actually skipping. There's two things that's happening. Once a tornado comes up off the ground, it's no longer a tornado. When it comes back down, it's a different tornado. So if the weather service catches it, it it's not really skipping, it's changing to a different tornado. Uh, but if, if the weather service doesn't see it, they won't, they won't say that. The other thing is, and the most likely thing is, that it weakens. It hits a house, weakens enough that the next house gets light damage. The next house, it picks up speed again, and so it's a weakening effect. So when you see it skipping, and there's a there's a good one uh, that happened in Winsboro in the, I'm gonna say it was the 30s. And I always thought my grandpa was telling me fib. <laughs> but he said there was a tornado come through, come through between Winsboro and Pickton and it hit this house and it tore the house completely up. But the kitchen table was still standing in the middle of the kitchen with a light, a lit lamp. The lamp didn't even blow out. 
And he said, people come from far and wide to see that. And I always thought, Grandpa, you crazy. <laughs> you're telling me one of your fibs. But last year, my neighbor was talking to me about something. It was a storm or something coming up. And he told me that same story. And he showed me where it was. It was right behind where I live. And he said, sure enough, that lamp was sitting on the table, still lit. So tornadoes are kind of funny. They do what they want. <laughs> So, uh, the length of tornadoes, that can be a few seconds. They can just come down and go back up, and they can be hours. Uh, the worst tornado ever was in 1924. Don't ask me where it was. It was in 1924. Oh, Oklahoma. <laughs> it was in 1924. I think it was South Texas. And that tornado lasted three hours. Jeez. Killed 700 people. There was an F5. It, according back then they didn't have the F thing, but what a monster. <laughs> so um, then we hear we, we hear the weatherman say there's a significant tornado coming. What's significant? That's anything over an EF two. An That's EF one just said in an EF two is significant. However, an EF zero can kill you. So it's we're not lightening it up by saying that F two is significant or just saying that it's going to cause more damage. And there's your scale there of the miles per hour. And EF5 is the highest. Um, what are what are most houses graded for? Like the, just the average? The average house is are rated for probably the, an EF2 would destroy a house, most of it. It would take the roof off, pull the walls out. Okay. Um, you know that one they had in Tyler? days ago or whatever happened it was a zero and it he caused some damage there in Tyler <laughs> yeah the one in Missouri people were like why don't they say it's an EF6 it was like 300 mile an hour wind because EF5 is the highest you're gonna go that's complete destruction my grandmother used to tell if me if it hits anywhere close to you it's destroying whatever is around you stories about how high the winds were that she's seen pine needles that stuck in mm -hmm. trees and stuff. That's yeah, all. pine needles, Hell feathers. Yeah. People took pictures of feathers and trees. So any of the any of them can kill you. Any of them can cause damage to your home. Probably your home's going to have significant damage if you're directly hit by EF2. It's going to be completely gone. Your neighbors are going to be gone and everything. EF5. <laughs> so it's it, EF5 is the one you don't want to see. However. EF5s are 0.1% of all tornadoes. So you're not really going to see an EF5. You might see, well, like we saw the one in our lifetime. That may be the only one we ever see. And, you know, our kids may see the next one. Then again, we can see one tomorrow. 77% <laughs> um, are less than a one, a one or less. And 90% are under three. So we're not talking about an EF5 every time a tornado comes, but we are talking about damage, and, th and that's what we need to know, what to do to prevent the damage, what to do to hide from <laughs> an EF5 tornado coming after you. So our next page has everybody seen that, right, before the taco meme? No. Okay, well. <laughs> This is the best way to, to explain to somebody, because you can tell them all day long that a watch is just a watch, that we have to worry about the warning. Because in Texas, nine months out of the year, we're going to watch. I had a friend from California, and she would freak out every time there was a watch. <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to be freaked out all year long. She would go to her tornado shelter, and I'm like, you don't need to go to your tornado shelter yet. <laughs> She's calmed down since then. But that's what that means. A watch means all the ingredients are there to make a taco or a tornado. You've got the right air, you've got the right storm, everything's coming together. Doesn't mean you're going to see one, so it doesn't mean you're going to eat a taco. It just means you've got all the ingredients to make one. A warning means there's a taco headed for you. If the taco's headed for you, if it's a taco, if it's a taco headed for you, open your mouth and eat it. Yeah. But also, that also means that the ingredients have come together. Somebody has seen the tornado. It's on radar. Whatever it is, 
It's coming after you. Find somewhere to go. The siren thing, I put that on there because I see this all the time on Facebook. The, the sirens will go off. And somebody will say, well, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear the sirens. Are you sure they went off? I didn't hear them. Because sirens aren't designed to hear from in your house. Oh, I can hear them. Some one, can. The ones Some can. Especially at night when there's nothing going. But if you've got your air conditioning, your TV, your radio, you're not going to hear those sirens. And that's... And that's not what that's not what they're designed for. I've never, huh? I've never heard of sirens. Yeah. Uh -huh. Even when it goes off, when they test them, it it, it just my blood pressure goes. <laughs> yeah. Sirens are designed once a month here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sirens are designed to be heard from outside. And my dog's they're your crazy. warning. They're your warning to go inside. Um, that's why. Oh yeah. That's why there's no signal for all safe. People ask that too. Why didn't they signal it all safe? Because you're supposed to be in your house already, and you're not supposed to be. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. You're you're not all safe. So <laughs> or you are. Either you went inside or you did. That's that's two things. You either went inside or you did. Um. We had this is this is going to be my thing about do as I say and not as I do. <laughs> this story. My mother lives in, or lived in Garland in our old home place. My family's been here for 200 years, but I was raised in Garland. And I was here taking care of my granddad. And my, I texted my mother one day because there was a tornado going straight for her house. I said, Mom, get in the closet. She said, I'm in the closet. I got my hard head on. I said, okay, let me know when it goes over so I'll know you're safe. So she did a couple of hours later, the same storm comes through. Drops a tornado between Winsboro and Picton. And we lived out that we lived out that way at the time. And my mom texts me. She says, That tornado's headed straight for you. You need to be in the closet or somewhere safe. And I look up and there's nobody in my house. I was like, That's everybody get in the closet. I was talking to myself. Front door's open. I go out there. They're standing in the garden, looking at the tornado, coming for them. So I just texted my mom. I said, never mind, we're just going to watch it kill us. <laughs> <laughs> it went away before it got to us, but you're not supposed to do that. And you're not supposed to Snapchat them. You're not supposed to put them on TikTok. People do that all the time. But the thing is, is your, wife, is your life worth getting that viral video? It's a viral video and getting a lot of views if you live, but if you die, what good is it? What, what good is it going to do you to be dead? So anyway, so here's, here's the part everybody's been waiting for. We're going to talk about what, what we do. And NOAA suggests, and the National Weather Service suggests, that we have a plan in place. I know we've talked about plans for no electricity and plans for other kinds of disasters. But we need to plan what we're going to do because tornadoes are quick. And tornadoes will kill you quick. And you're not going to have time to think about where am I going to go. If you don't have a tornado shelter, where are you going to go? Does anybody know where the safe places are? Interior if you don't room, have a shelter. No Interior room, no windows. If you're outside of the Most of the time, bathrooms are the best place because they have the pipes. If you're stuck outside, you hit a ditch. You do not go under the overpass. Don't go under the tree. Don't go in the tree. <laughs> don't go under the tree because there's lightning. But if you're, people take shelter in overpasses all the time, but tor tornadoes can suck you out of the overpass. So just hit the ground, get out of your car and lay in the ground. The deepest part of the ground you get, a ditch, whatever, and then pray. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and it's funny because I build shelters and I don't have one. Um, I do have one in the house I'm in now, but I can't use it. In the storm, it'll be about three or four feet deep in water. And in the summertime, there's an ant hill that fills almost the entire thing. Nice. So I can't use it, so I use an interior room. I have a bathroom without a window. So that's what I do. I have nothing in my house. That's not good. 
Yeah. You need to come to my house in the swamp? <laughs> no, you need to go to Stacy's house. No, I used to go, when, I, when we had trouble, I'd go to Steve and Sherry's house. Uh, my friend Stacy had a shelter put in, and she has all kinds of stuff in there. I mean, she could probably live in there six months. My brother, be down, fine. My brother down at Holly Lake has one, too. <laughs> And she carries, she puts carriers for her cats. She's got carriers inside. She's got carriers in the in the shelter too. Yes. Yeah. You can't call the cat. Okay. I got my dog's leash in my safe room. Yeah. So anyway, the part, FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security offer these ideas, and they are to get a kit and to make a plan. So we've talked about those this a, a, a couple of months ago you should have a bug out bag or a go bag whichever one you want to call it I got in trouble for calling it a bug out bag but you have this is my medical kit it has my temporary shelter it has my life it has I might can chop out of my house okay. <clears throat> whatever I need that for um, it's got sutures in there and needle in case something falls on somebody and I have to sew them up, because I know how to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> My blankets, because it might be cold. And then this bag carries my food kits. And it's just me and my husband right now at our house. So I have a food kit for three days for each one of us. This is, this is enough food for three days. It may not taste good, and I may want to eat the whole thing at once because I'm hungry. <laughs> but it's split up in, into three bars. And there's enough calories. It's not saying you're going to be full. It's not it's saying like you're going to be sick. something? Yeah, it's almost like a granola bar, a fatty, fatty granola bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did they used to call that uh, that they had back in the Army days? The Marines, the Marines. Yeah. So they're not delicious, but they'll keep you alive. There's, I think, 3,500 calories in each bar. Yeah, and that, that's probably not very expensive. Was it like 12 bucks? Um, I think this one I think is probably about right. So that's pretty cheap. You just live off that. Yeah. Yeah, we should just <laughs> buy a whole bunch of them and yeah. eat them from now on because yeah. there's three days worth of food there. Four yeah, it's, it's split up. It's actually split, <laughs> split up in six. So that you could eat, you can eat two bars a day. Yeah. Uh, and then this is this is. Like was saying, the shelf life on that probably says five years on there. Five years. But it's probably good for. Probably good for longer than long that. Time. This is the water. I got three days worth of water. Is that dehydrated water? Nope, it's, it's not dehydrated water. It's real water. I don't think they make dehydrated water. You almost got me there. <laughs> It will get you through barely, it, yeah. but it will get you through in three days. You can also carry and put in your space that you're going to hide in. You can put bottles of water. Yeah, so a gallon of person or whatever, it'll, it'll get you through. But this is just in case you can't, for some reason, get to that water. So that, that's what we've got. And somebody put Vienna sausages in there. <laughs> that I may eat those when I get home. <laughs> so, there's my little tornado with tacos flying around. That's funny. So, you got to ask yourself where you're going to shelter, of course. And yeah, I asked my brother, I said, that has the storm shelter down in Holly Lake, I said, can I bring my dogs? And he said, nope. And I said, well, forget it, I ain't coming then. <laughs> And I've got over there. I've got two different kinds of help. They, it you look stupid, you feel stupid. But if the ceiling falls in on you, that's going to keep you from popping your head open and spilling or your nail or nails. Yeah. So we use our hard hats. A lot of people use bicycle helmets. I think hard hats are probably a little more secure. But you just feel stupid for a while, especially if the tornado doesn't hit you. 
how you want to look when the fire department finds you yeah. yeah and that's the thing too dylan's with the fire department and he can tell you a little bit about what the fire department does they actually do things before the tornado and after the tornado so what some of the things y'all do many of you probably know me my name's dylan um, as she said i work for the fire department here in winsboro and uh I'm, we were supposed to have some other people from the department come, and they were unable to because of short notice. But I might not be the most qualified person to talk on this because I've only been on the department for about six months. But unfortunately, in those six months, we had, did have to deal with a uh, tornado here in Picton that hit. It destroyed uh, five houses, no injuries, uh, luckily. But So the very first thing that happens when we know that there's a storm coming is we we have a little group chat that all the firefighters are in to see who's going to be in town and who will be available in case something does happen so that we know uh, who might be able to show up and some of us what i like to do is we about an hour before it's expected to hit town or anywhere around town we'll go up to the station and just hang out in case so we'll be there already before anything bad happens, and so a, and that station's a pretty it's a pretty thick brick building, isn't it? Uh, the only brick part on our station, I think, is just the front facade. Oh. But like the <laughs> the fire department, the police department side are all sheet metal, but it's still a pretty sturdy building. So, and we have it, there's no pretty much no windows. So, but we'll, we'll be pretty protected. But so what will happen is. If a tornado or a funnel cloud or a warning, if the warning comes across, we'll get paged out to all come to the station just in case. But uh, if there's a report that there is a funnel cloud or a tornado, uh, we'll get paged out and they'll tell us right about where it is. And some of us will get in the fire truck. Uh, usually we'll get in our little grass truck or our uh, medical unit that has saws and they're a little uh, sturdier. We have winches on them so, uh, and brush guards, so they're real sturdy and we can get through any kind of damage there might be. But we go to where uh, they say this tornado or funnel, potential funnel cloud is, and we'll just watch it. And we'll follow it along. And if it does turn into a tornado, uh, we'll keep following it, kind of like a storm chaser. That's what it's called is storm spotting. And, uh, if we notice that it hits, uh, it hits a uh, uh, house or something, we see debris, we'll stop. If it's a house, we'll do search and rescue on that house. And if everybody's fine, we'll move on. Um, if it starts moving towards the city, we'll give a dispatch, let dispatch know that it's heading that way so that they can give the proper warnings, sound sirens, and so on. And so a lot of times like what happened in Picton is kind of far away so we get there after the fact and what actually had happened was Hopkins County actually that's not our jurisdiction but Hopkins County actually called us and said we can't actually get to where the tornado damage is because power on lines and trees were in the bottom so what we did was we went over there and we started search and rescue and uh, we just go house to house uh, most of the time, but when in that case, pretty much everybody was already out of their house because they had already moved on, and at that time it wasn't even raining. It was really kind of clearing up. You can almost see blue skies. So everybody was pretty much outside of their house taking pictures and so on. So we kind of knew which houses were, uh, which houses might have potential victims. But, uh, you know, ask, hey, is there anybody in there? And a good thing to keep in mind is being in your uh, safe space because those are probably the first places we're going to look. We're going to search the whole house. The very first place we're going to look is at where you should be. So, and then um, if a house is completely destroyed, we're going to be 
looking for signs if there's anybody there because we have a lot of abandoned houses or if somebody's not home, so we're going to look for is there a car in the garage or, or not, I guess the garage if there's anything left over any uh, anything in around that will say hey there's somebody in here <clears throat> do you do you guys have a protocol where <clears throat> sorry do you guys have a protocol where like hey this house looks a little messed up and um, we need to turn the electricity off. We need to turn the gas off. Do you guys have any kind of, or do you guys, uh, is it kind of a judgment call when you're there? It's kind of a judgment call because um, we would have to get with the electric company because we're not authorized to turn electricity off, so we'd have to call them. But we can look at, most of the time the power lines are going to be down anyway, but we'll go ahead and because other people, other lives are at stake, we'll kind of kind of try to stay away from them. But, uh, if there's a house that's, you know, really badly damaged, we'll probably just, because the last tornado we had, we didn't do anything like that. I mean, if there, if there is gas, we can smell gas, we'll shut it off, or we can actively see that there's electric lines flailing about, and we can see that it's a danger, then we'll get that shut off. But, uh, and that's another thing, is the potential dangers that, um, that a, destroyed house can cause. We gotta really move slowly and cautiously and really think about what the next step is because we don't want to step on nails. We got pretty really thick boots, but we don't really want to step on a nail mm -hmm. and think about uh, maybe a halfway destroyed house. What dangers are gonna be in there? We wanna make sure we're not gonna go into a house and then it collapse. We, we see in the movies all the time, they just run in grab the person run out and then it collapsed. Well, we're not gonna just <laughs> run into a building that may collapse. We're gonna think about this. Because how are we gonna save other people if we get hurt? So, and think about if I take this piece of debris out, what's it gonna do to the rest of your structure? Is it gonna fall? So there are a lot of things we gotta think about before we can actually go and start doing rescue. But uh, something to think about, she was talking about different things we can keep in our go bags. That's something that's really important. We've had a training meeting not too long ago about this. Is It's a course called Stop the Bleed. And we're really encouraged to have tourniquets. And I'm sure everybody knows what a tourniquet is. It's the thing that goes on your arm, your leg, that tightens up really, really tight, that cuts off the blood flow to you. So if you cut your arm off and it's bleeding everywhere, it cuts off that blood flow. So that's a, sure to fart like you're trying, like that. <laughs> that is something you can do. Is shirts or uh, a lot of people will say belts work really good as tourniquets, but that is actually a misconception. Belts are one probably one of the worst things you can use as a tourniquet because you might can get it tight enough because it has to have a lot of pressure to cut off blood flow. You might can get it tight enough, but once once you once you get it tight or it's gonna loosen immediately after you let go. But the ones we're recommended to have, I have one in my truck and we've got probably who knows how many at our apartment in our medical bags. They're called the cat style tourniquet. And what it is, is it's, you put it on and there is a little plastic rod. And you twist that rod and it tightens up and then it's got a little stopper. Once you get it tightened up to where you quit seeing blood, it stops and it holds pressure there immediately. And so what we say, tell everybody that we apply a tourniquet to is, this is gonna hurt really, really bad, <laughs> but it's better than you bleeding out because it hurts. We, we had them put on ourselves when we did our test. It hurts quite a bit. It didn't hurt as bad as I thought it would, but when you're already have an injury bad enough to have a tourniquet and your adrenaline, it's gonna hurt really bad. But it's better than bleeding out. Yeah, so that's I think about one of those cuffs that little pressure cuffs. How yeah, it yeah. Comes up, comes up. It keeps coming up. Hurts. Yeah, and then of course your arm goes numb. But when you're in an emergency situation, you're not really thinking about it, whether it hurt. It's you're gonna be hurt anyway. So that's the thing. Or like you can just sew the arm back on. Yeah. If you have time <laughs> and you yes. have the know-how, then sure, go ahead. But, <laughs> just give it a good college try. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's something important. Like I said, I have one in my truck. Oh, of course. Along with uh, plenty of gauze and for wound packing, that's another thing 
that we were trained on. But having a tourniquet is really important because when you're bleeding out, you're going to want to keep as much of that stuff in you as possible. And that's the quickest way to get get that um, that blood to stop. And we'll write down a time so that when you get to the hospital, they'll know uh, how long it's been on. And then also, if we do have to pack the wound, which is... Uh, taking gauze or something else and actually putting it in the wound to stop it from bleeding. We'll put how much is in there so that when they get to the hospital they know exactly how much to pull out and if they are missing something, right, well there's something else in there because they want to sew you up and you have a piece of cotton or something in your arm. So, but, um, also if you have a wound on the head or trunk, yeah. direct pressure. Yeah, that's another thing because you can't you can't turn and get a head wound. You know that's that's gonna cause a lot more problems. <laughs> you cut off the blood flow, but you cut off a lot of other things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you guys have a lot of mylar blankets for shock. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we do have some yeah. blankets for shock, and then we also we of course have some of my kit too. Yeah, because uh, you think it's gonna be it's gonna be rainy. Everybody's gonna be wet, and yeah. miserable. And I would I would put this bleeding. around Pete, and then I would take the duct tape. <laughs> Would you let Pete out or no? No. No. Put it on his mouth. Not today, I yeah. will. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. I might change my mind. It's a daily but, thing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's another thing we learned about is direct pressure, of course, wound packing on a wound that we can't tourniquet. And another thing I want to emphasize that I forgot to emphasize earlier about tourniquets is the rule is high and tight. You might have a wound somewhere on your bottom leg, it's not going to help if you turn it get way down here. So you want to get it as high up as possible and then turn it and get that blood stop, uh, you know, upstream. And, and avoid the scrotums. Yes, <laughs> that is very important. And I'm sure they'll definitely let you know if you got that gone. <laughs> what about if that's fun. what you cut? Uh, then we're probably not going to be using right, the direct pressure. <laughs> that's that's going to be one of those direct, direct pressure. pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, 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 I call not it on that, on the, on the, that <laughs> assignment. <laughs> Sorry, Chief, I can't, just can't do that. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. But any other wounds that, because, you know, tourniquets are generally for limbs, so legs and arms. If we can't, uh, there's a wound like abdomen, chest, head, that's when the wound packing would come in and the direct pressure. And then the chest is a, a different story. That's because that's where your lungs are, of course, and if you get a lung puncture, then you're going to have, you're going to be sucking in air from that wound. So there's a little different procedure for that. We have, I don't remember exactly what it's called. I can't remember the name of it, but basically it's just a, a three-sided, it's, I don't know, it's like made out of some kind of rubber, and it's got adhesive on three sides, and you stick it on there, and it's like a diaphragm, and it'll let air out the side that doesn't have adhesive but it won't let air back in so that's something that we would use if you have a lung puncture to keep the air flowing out but not letting any in and also if you have don't have access to one of those uh, you can use tape and just whatever you have laying around so if you have like a piece of, of uh, you use duct tape if you have like say the outside of this if you already ate some of your food you take this, cut a little square, big enough to cover the wound, slap it on there, and then take three sides of it, and that will help it keep the air from going in, but letting it come out. So we had a very extensive class on that, and we were hoping to get some more training with, uh, there's a place, I don't remember where it's from, but they'll come by with an actual, like, super realistic dummy that will move and it actually shoots blood out and we can really get some good testing on it, so. Oh, that's my new job. <laughs> you want to be a dummy? Yeah. 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 But, but something else like in Picton that we had, uh, our trucks, we had to throw them in four wheel drive and actually pull our, a giant oak tree out of the way. And that's another thing that we'll have to do and some people might have to wait for that because we had an ambulance and there was a, uh, they, there was somebody up ahead that was going into cardiac arrest, but there was a giant oak tree. 
So we had to cut as much as we could and we throw our winch over it and hold it in the reverse until we get it out of the road. But so that's another thing we have to deal with cutting down trees just so we can get to where the houses are destroyed. So but luckily in Picton there wasn't too much. Uh, pretty much everybody was already out of their house, so we didn't have to do too much search and rescue. There's one house right there on the highway. Uh, like there was nobody in front of, but there was somebody inside to go inside and check on him, but he was fine, so. But I don't remember what, was that an EF1? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> but it still did a lot of damage. One house was actually completely destroyed. Um, I think it was a trailer house, actually, that was completely destroyed. But most of them, the roof is off and some of the walls are even down. So I recently spoke with somebody who is, uh, um, probably in one of those houses. Yeah. And um, he was playing pool with a couple of his friends and started to notice that there's a tornado coming. Mm -hmm. And so um, everybody got inside, and um, he he's probably got PTSD after this. But he said the the wind was so loud mm -hmm. it kind of picked up his house and it moved it a couple of feet. Really. And so while he was inside the house, yeah. that was. Be terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Be terrifying because you don't know what's going to happen. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Riding bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, I've only been on the department for about four, uh, five, six months, so I'm not really the most qualified. Well, it sounds like you're learning a ton, man. Yeah. Definitely, am learning he's a lot. Going, but he's going to the big school in Austin. Yeah. Not uh, Is that your city? Is that uh, what that one's called? Uh, yeah, I think they, yeah, the Teaks Fire School, yeah. and uh, they're in College Station. Yeah, they have the Disaster City over there. That is awesome. I've always seen he's YouTube. Going, he's going in July. Yeah. If I can It'll get my be really smart then. Yeah. yeah. If, if I can get my truck fixed. <laughs> that's yeah, the big, that's the big thing. Uh, yeah, they have the Disaster City over there, and I won't be doing any, they said I probably might get one or two fires there. But it's mainly classroom because I'm going for my fire one, mm -hmm. and they go up to fire five, and one is pretty much just like the classroom learning, and then two till like five is like ship fires, like yeah. offshore oil rig fires, like planes. They'll stick you in a boat. Yeah, and, never see here. <laughs> uh, yeah, something we we would never see here. I mean, I guess you could get. Maybe yeah, probably. Yeah, they do that a lot too. Of our train <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> things like that, but that's further on, like two, three, four, and five. But like I think in five, they'll they'll actually go on a boat, stick you down in the engine room, and you have to fight your way back out and stuff like that. It's very very cool how they do it. That's cool. I've got claustrophobia too bad to be a firefighter. I saw them. He was showing me a video of them learning how to climb, put their whole body through a ladder, two rounds of a ladder. Like it blindfolded. I'm like, no, no. Yeah. I'd get about halfway through that rung and get stuck and yeah. start crying. <laughs> so well, have to have to take no and then they'd have to rescue you. No, well, that's why we wear the mask is so you There's don't no see us. Crying. Crying. Oh, we're, we're crying. We're crying. We're, we're terrified. You can't see it because we have the mask on. So, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so that's a little bit of our, our standard operating procedure, if you will. Uh, Kind of what happens during that, and then of course once you a big fire or a, a big tornado, there might be fires. Then it's a little bit different, but but I put the wet stuff on the hot stuff is pretty much what we do. If you see orange, shoot it. So or shoot it with the hose. So but yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. Is be careful. Uh, they like to say. Uh, Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So if we just go in there all gung ho, then we get hurt and possibly hurt somebody else. So, but I mean, that's, that's pretty much that's all there is. Well, thank you. No problem. One more thing I'm going to talk about with shelters, because there's several kinds of shelters. You see the metal ones? Um, Facebook has them on all the time. The metal big metal ones you can put in your house, in your garage, or whatever. Um, always make sure that when you buy a shelter that it can open inside. 
Because it, like the ones that stick out of the ground only open to the outside. So if a tree falls on it, you're stuck in your shelter unless Dylan comes and looks in the shelter to see if you're in the shelter. Because <laughs> that's where you should be, right? Um, people have, here we don't have basements most of the time. Uh, we do have underground shelters made out of concrete. Uh, you can get metal ones, you can get uh, fiberglass ones. And you can get, you can make them out of block. The only thing about those is some people are claustrophobic. Some people do not like to be under the ground. They get scared. But I think a lot of times you, if your shelter is inconvenient to get to mm -hmm. and it's filled with Water. old stuff and <laughs> snakes and Potatoes and onions. Potatoes and <laughs> That's what grandpa's would be. Potatoes and onions. So if something happens, you know, a lot of times there's some there's probably what ninety false alarms for every one or a thousand false alarms. And you gotta go there and you gotta clean every stuff everything out and then you know kill all the snakes and then and then you hang out for yeah, however long. Exactly. Right. So I think yeah. You know, human nature would be, you know, I don't want to do that every time. Yes. So if you had something that was bigger or something like what you're going to talk about, mm -hmm. that would be a lot easier to, uh, you know, be in for an extended period of time. Yes. And that's what we're going to talk about is our preferred, this is what we prefer to make our shelters out of. This is ICF, insulated concrete form. And these are styrofoam. But if you put one above the ground, it will it will last through an EF five. Three hundred miles an hour is what this is rated for. And you you guys for, bolt it down into the concrete and everything. It's it depends on what what you want. Um, yeah. We can if we even put concrete roofs on. The thing is, you can build your entire house out of this. No, and you would have. Do you have an ICF helm? And you're you're set. It's bulletproof. It's explosion proof. It's fire rated for four hours on fire. So you could have a wildfire come through because wildfire takes what twenty minutes to, to cover your house. Your house is still going to be standing. Hurricane proof. So if you built your whole house out of this, you would just have uh, nope. An entire there, house. You would sit there and recline her and say, "Well, I wouldn't do only... that. I was still get in an interior room because you still got windows." <laughs> and, and you also have a roof too. If you don't put a and concrete you have a roof. roof. The thing about this is, if you build your house out of out of this, the reason roofs come off of houses is because there's nothing holding them. It's matchsticks. Matchsticks holding your roof together. So if you build your entire house out of this and anchor your roof to the concrete floor form it can go through an EF4. It'll rip wow. your shingles off and it might mess up your roof a little bit but it's still going to be there. Because that's the reason a roof comes off. The wind comes through and picks it up from underneath and just pulls all the wood out from under your house. Um, you might still have a little bit of damage if you if you still use a structure on the inside of your house but most likely not. It's not quite rated for an EF5, but it, it, your roof will, an EF0 to an EF3, you're fine, which is most tornadoes. So, this is... So you put that in, and then you stucco or you brick or something. You can outside. do whatever you want. With, and in fact, if you, if you build like a little shelter about, say, the size of a, a, a shed, you can decorate it inside just like a house. Put your drywall up, paint it, put some furniture in there, and you can just sit there and relax as the tornado comes through. You have to put um, studs before you put the drywall, or you put the drywall you, directly to Drywall goes directly to it. That's cool. Here, uh, here is some pictures. Some of these you may have seen, but the second page is my favorite house. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want to share? We'll share. So the second one was Hurricane, the second page. The second page is uh, the one that's the most famous. That one was Hurricane Michael. You see everybody else's houses are gone. 
That one still has its roof, still has its porch. Those people came in, I think they said there was like $15,000 worth of damage from the windows being broke out. How's that? They put the, they put the new siding on the side of it. But that's what you get when you build your house. But even if you don't want to build a whole house, you can build the inside, you can inside your house, you can build a safe room. Out of a closet, make it a walk-in closet. Looks like a walk-in closet, but it ain't no walk-in closet, it's a safe room. Or you can build a whole room, huh? Where do you get this material? This is the brand we usually use, it's called Fox Block. And I think they're based out of Oklahoma. Uh, we order it all the time, keep it on our yard. I grabbed this one. Dylan grabbed it for me. This is only a half size when they cut it. I didn't get a whole size one. So it's about double the size. And it comes, this one's a 12 inch. But they come in 6, 8, and 12. So what would be the benefit of getting a 12 versus a 6 inch? Convenience, more, like, more than anything else. Uh, okay. They're all strong. Uh... But a six the, inch 12, the, probably... 12 inch, the 12 inch is going to take more room up. Yeah. The most common size that would be used would be eight. Yeah. This but, this comes off of uh, Tyler. Yeah, I came off of Tyler Junior College. Tyler Junior College. And they built a gymnasium out of this. Not the rest of the school. So when there's a tornado coming, everybody heads everybody to the gym. Knows. The gym is completely safe. And they, they did it out of the 12? They did it out of the 12. Yeah. They actually did half of it in 12 and half of it in 8. So I'm not sure exactly why. But the 12, the 12 will, of course, be stronger than the... Well, you got the 4, okay, 6, 8, 12, yeah. 16. You can get a 16 inch as well. These are, these are samples but, that I show people. Just, just little miniature ones so you can kind of see. Yeah. Yeah. These are green as well. You know what they look like. Yeah. <laughs> Ours look like a giant. Do you want to see one? You just pour concrete in the middle, and then you just use a vibrating tool to yes. get it all to come down? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and it stacks, as you see, it stacks like Legos. In fact, in fact, one of the first ones I ever saw them building online was the Fox Blocks Company. Yeah. And they actually painted on red and yellow and blue and green. Uh, so it looked like a giant. You know, they, they put stuff on the outside of it afterward, but just for a demonstration. Yeah, this, is pretty, so, this is pretty sturdy to get sale. Yeah. This, you'll never have to use insulation. This is completely insulated yeah. because, of the, because of the styrofoam. And then, of course, you have four, six, eight, 10, 12, 16 inches of concrete. It's pretty well insulated. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, you have the concrete. And then on so, the outside, you could just put your metal sheeting on the outside. It goes like it screws into the concrete. Okay, see, see, I don't know if you can see it on this one. Well, I guess you can see it on those too. If you if you look inside, the little plastic deals on the inside, mm -hmm. that's where you hook everything to. Oh. On the outside, you hook your. So you could mark all those? And... Yes, you could put your stucco, stone, block, whatever you so, what you, would, you were saying about something you said about uh, marking, if you look on this one, it'll says the Fox Fox logo oh, yeah. every that's 16 what, inches. Huh. That's where that's where your stud is. So you never really have to measure where your stud is. Because on, on a right. traditional framed house, of course, we know from uh, putting our wall ties on for our brick, it's very rarely ever 16 inches on center, and if it is. You got bars going like that. So with this, you never have to guess where your stud is. And then it might look flimsy, the plastic, but uh, so th these as you saying they're green. This is almost completely recycled material. And if you ever, if you've ever ate a, a hungry man or a, another TV dinner, you'll recognize this plastic because when they make those trays that they come in. They cut out around the form or ed cut around the edges. They take the whatever's cut off of those trays and they make these out of them. And then really once they're not very sturdy, well, they're pretty sturdy even with no concrete. But when you pour concrete on here, they say I, th I think they said it's 
two times stronger than uh, yellow pine. So once you drill into it, you're just never gonna, you're never gonna go nowhere. So on the outside, you put whatever on the side you want, and on the inside, you put it on the wall. That's crazy. And it looks That's the cool. house is built out of this. I don't. I've never seen your house. The house is built out of this. Look just like a traditional built house. Inside, you'd never know where it's been. Yeah. But we, our outside finish is concrete block, uh, made out of. <coughs> Limestone, so it's the white color, the whitish yellow, and uh, it's just a veneer that the bricklayer put on the outside. So our walls are about this thick. Yeah, about There's six one eight inches thick. Wow. Holly Lake that he actually he's got his house, and we can't say where it is or anything because he built a bunker under the ground out of the concrete block. I mean, out of the ICF block with a secret exit. It's the size of his house. It's 2,800 square feet. Wow. And it looks like a house on the inside. Oh, oh, so if he goes in there, you couldn't even tell it if it, except that you know that, you know, it's under the ground. And, uh, you know, we can't, most of our stuff we take pictures of when we build it, but we can't take pictures of stuff like that because somebody might end up with a picture of where it's at and how to get in. So, but also there's another one. <clears throat> I believe it's in Holly Lake too. And he just built he built a room. One of his bedrooms is all he built out of this. The rest of it's traditional. And his is a safe room as well. It's got it's got the big metal door that shuts. So if he ever has to, but it looks like a regular door to put in your on it. So That's cool. somebody comes in his house, he puts his family in there. I've done it before. <laughs> Brian and Cliff. Yeah. Brian and Cliff. Yeah. <laughs> this truck actually got stuck. Oh, well, yeah. Because it's a continuous pour. They, mm -hmm. It looked like a giant beer cooler when they mm -hmm. did the exterior. And then I think it was five concrete trucks, and about the third one got stuck in the sand out there. You should have seen the contractor trying to get that truck up there. That's funny. Get the concrete. Because they needed yeah. to keep, keep that pour going. going. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is our favorite thing. And that's what I was going to show you. I said that it was bomb proof. This was a military blast test. They did three buildings, three different shelters. The only one that survived was the ICF. So it doesn't have any sound. I don't know why it doesn't have sound. But oh, I think you have to put this, turn the sound bar on. No, it's the actual oh. video it doesn't have any Never sound. Mind. But they were demonstrating how strong this ICF was. There they are. You can't already see anything has happened to them. Isn't that unbelievable? That was their concrete one with pieces of concrete everywhere. There's their metal ones. And there's their ICF one. It blew the plastic off of it but the concrete's still there so if you were inside there you would have probably felt it a little bit because of the blast yeah. but you would be fine so how do you how do you pour a ceiling it's 
they'll so what uh what they'll do is we have called what they're called embed plates and i wish i had a picture of one but it's just like a square plate sorry. and it and it has uh depending on what size the plate it's got either two or four or how many ever uh little dowels that come through and they'll set those in the concrete get them all level and then you can weld I'm your uh, subfloor which is just made out of con uh, um, steel beams and they'll uh, see put sheet metal like. or kind of like sheet metal it's a real strong sheet metal they'll make the roofs out of them this way too and then put their rebar and pour concrete it's awesome yeah, yeah. It's, anytime house in South Florida yeah. when I was living down here. It was called a bunker house. Mm -hmm. And it was a poured concrete house. Floor, walls, ceiling, I mean, roof, everything. And they were impervious to anything. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much this too. Why don't they do that out here? Well, down there they have a lot of earth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the ground out here shifts a lot, right? With the... Yeah, but with an ICF with an ICF house, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere, and nobody's coming in if you don't want them in. Except for the windows. Except for the windows. Except for the windows. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Is that what Han Solo was put in? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I guess yeah, if you put are, bank these, windows in there, it would be both we, proof. That's why yeah. we recommend these to people when they ask us about shelters, is because you can't you can't beat these. It's going to be a little more expensive, but like even with your house, even with your house, if you built your whole house out of this, it's slightly more expensive. But then you see the change in your electric bill, the change in your gas bill, because it's super efficient. Is it difficult? So say. So say you wanted to run like a hole through there for electricity or whatever. You just get a big old masonry drill bit and just go all the way through. No, you don't even have to. Actually, what we, they use is a uh, pretty much a hot knife. Yeah, it's a hot they knife. Make, they make a styrofoam part. Yeah, that's how they cut these too. So this, this was cut with a hot knife. So you just put the electrical in the... Actually, that was cut with a uh, just a regular handsaw. But mm -hmm. Conduit and then... You put the conduit inside the concrete, and then you cut your holes in. Oh, so you plan this ahead of time. Yes, you're mm -hmm. planning the house ahead of time, like you should. Plan ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you should always plan your house ahead of time. Yes, that makes a lot more sense. We, the contractor who did our ICF, recommended getting a cheap electric chainsaw and just cutting slots, and that's where all the conduit went. Mm -hmm. After the walls were in place. Yeah, you can do that too. Yeah. Just yeah. Swap. Yeah, so I think that's usually how they do it. And that makes it easier also to repair it later. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. you're not trying to bust through concrete. Yeah, that's right. But so I'm assuming you love your ICF house. We do. Yeah. yeah. We do. I don't Most people who end up, at first, uh, some people are skeptical, but once they end up with their shelter or their home or their little walk in closet, whatever it is, they're happy with it. Yeah, we have a closet that has no exterior uh, exposure. That has a leash in there for my dog. <laughs> most important thing. And you are already prepared. Be, uh, you know, there, there are no windows or any any kind of exterior. Thanks, Tim. I gotta go. Okay, we'll see you later. I'm, I'm just about done. Does anybody have any questions about anything? When did y'all start doing ICF out here? Um. We've been we've been having it for a while. Um, we really got into it in around 2018, 2019. We actually were gonna we actually did a class from the Fox Box company. They came out, they catered food, and we had a whole class for homeowners and for other contractors that might be interested in it. And everybody got to put one together. Everybody got to put a wall up. It was really neat, and that was right when COVID started. And so we had that class, and then we were going to have the tornado class after that, and they wouldn't let us put people inside of our office anymore, so we didn't. 
So do you have corner blocks? For yep. Blocks? Yep. Corner hmm. blocks for the corners. They make T blocks, so T-blocks. you can make an intersecting wall. You can actually make your entire house out of it. Some they, people, they make... some people still put sticks in the middle, you know, to separate the rooms out. But yeah. but most people just build the whole house out of it. And so then you basically frame your door, and then whoever's going to come put your door in, they put the frame in there, level it all out. They just put it into the concrete, I guess. Yeah. We, and we we, uh, we actually have to make the openings a rough opening. Yeah. And we, they're called door and window bucks. Yeah. And when you're building it, you'll just leave opening for your window, you know, however big it needs to be for a rough opening. And then uh, they make a, a buck, Fox Blocks does, that you can try on the whole window and then you'll put your uh, block in, or your uh, blocks of wood, like uh, on the, every side, and your spreader pieces of wood for spreaders that'll keep it from going in and out and stuff. And then when you pour concrete, it all stays in. And then you have your doors and your windows. That's really cool. Yeah, it's really but innovative. But you're through it, you have set in concrete. Yeah. You're not going to change your exterior. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's set in stone, so to speak, literally. Yeah, set in stone. Your house is set in stone. But, yeah, the, Texas is, is pretty new to it. Um, Florida was the first ones to do it in areas on the coast were first and then people were like wait a minute if these can withstand a hurricane why can't they withstand a tornado too and they can and that's what a lot of people don't like the underground thing so you can build the above ground shelter and make it look like the shed match the house with the brick or the stone or whatever siding you've got and it just looks like a shed and you go in you can, you can decorate it the way you want or you can leave it plain that's pretty cool but a lot of people like to decorate it, then it looks like home, even though it's a shelter. Yeah. So Make I, a man cave or... She shed. She shed. Basements used to be a, you know, if you go northeast or just north, right, basements are a big deal. Everybody mm-hmm. has a basement, right? But out in Texas, like, nobody's, very few people actually have a basement. And when I was researching it, and a lot of it is because... Um, I guess the contractors don't know how to seal very well the basement, and so it just becomes problematic for everybody. Yeah. So everybody if you won't have people. this problem. If you yeah. want, if you want a basement, you're building a house and you want a basement. This is the way to go. Yeah. Because you almost can't mess it up. I mean, you can mess it up. It, a lot of people do mess it up, but it's. I mean, it's sealed already. Yeah. <clears throat> That's so cool. As long as you put the fox blocks together correctly and fill them correctly with concrete. Of course, you probably still have to do some water uh, waterproofing. Yeah, you still have to waterproof it. Yeah. Because awesome. it is underground. But Yeah, they're cool. If I was to build my own house, I'd build my house out of it. Second choice would be block. So, so the benefit of this other block is insulation, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and, and block would be insulated if you built with concrete, but it won't be rated as high as this one. Yeah. And it won't act, it actually probably wouldn't be as rated as high because you still have cells that aren't poured. Yeah. But you would miss cells. The uh, the R value, I don't remember the this this uh, It's really high. I don't remember the whole thing about the R values, but it's way higher than any especially stick frame houses and block houses. But you got the sturdiness of it and you've got the insulation value and what you spend on building the house, because it's gonna be more expensive, of course, you're gonna save that in a few years anyway with not having to have your AC running so long and the heat running so long. Yeah, you got peace of mind with it too. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Ignore it. Ignore it. I wouldn't thing. ignore it. I would still go in an interior room because you still got oh, windows. Yeah. Well, well you, you'd be just like this little stick figure over here pointing a shotgun at the tornado. I ain't scared of no nader. <laughs> that was Dylan's idea. That, yeah. Well, that's that's usually what I do is I'll, I'll go outside in my lawn chair drinking a beer with a shotgun in my hand. You've probably seen me out there. <laughs> Now you're going to be looking for me yeah, next time. Yeah, now you're looking, yeah. 
I need to make trailer covers. The problem with that is it's more, it'll probably be more expensive than the trailers are worth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big roll up doors. Mm. Awesome. But that's it if nobody has questions. Well, thank you. I know, yeah, yeah, I know most of it was stuff we already knew. No, this but it's great. always good to have reminders. Is there an idea as far as like cost per square foot cost per um, it has foot. gone up since i've checked it so i'm not sure right, what the cost per square foot is right now yes it's a it's a, it's a little bit higher than building a stick home a little bit or like twice or three times no it wouldn't be twice or three times okay that's really awesome um, i can look into that for you well yeah we're thinking about uh, you a, a garage Thank you, everybody, for joining my live and all who uh, sent me up. <laughs> By the way, this is the uh, little stick uh, you know what we're Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. I don't think y'all were doing ICF when we built our house. Probably not. It was. When did you have yours done? Uh, probably, probably the ICF part. It was about twenty. Because our house. the contractor who did our ICF just wiped out. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's there's a couple of us now. Um, there's one Tyler. There's us, and there's one that is in the now. We have two male prongs. We've been very happy. So if you plug one in, I really put that in the shelters or whatever.